Track or treat? <laughs> You're a collie, son. Our boys rest nothing. <laughs> Grace in seven, Ireland, do da, do da. Grace in seven. Jesus, Collie, so they're all out of die. <laughs> Grace in seven. I felt sick. I felt such shame. I was ashamed of him. I was ashamed of marrying someone that came from him. I was ashamed of standing in the same place as men like him. It was, it was beyond words. It was beyond feeling. No, shut up. Shut up. Stop! I'm Matthew Michael Honey. I'm a theatre director. I'm a football fan. I'm a child of the peace process. 1994, I was none of those things. I was five years old, and my mother, Mary Jones, wrote that play, A Night in November. It's one of the bravest things she's ever done. You see, the year prior, November 17th, 93, a football match took place between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland at Windsor Park in Belfast. Stakes and the pitch were high. The Republic were vying for a spot in the 94 World Cup. All Northern Ireland could hope to achieve was a foil for their rivals. The stakes in the stands were higher. This game took place after 25 years of conflict, where religion was a label that changed it to a political identity and by extension to a national football team. The Republic were the representatives of the Catholic Irish Nationalist South and Windsor had become a stronghold of Protestant British Unionist North while darker manifestations roamed the streets as loyalist and Republican gunmen, respectively. The previous month was the deadliest in 17 years. 23 people lost their lives in a series of attacks. 10 mostly Protestant when men walked into a chip shop in the Shankill Road and planted a bomb. A further seven Catholic when gunmen walked into a pub in Grey Steel on Halloween night, shouted trick or treat and ended their lives. Amid all this chaos, a football match took place and transformed Windsor into a metaphor for vile sectarian loyalist abuse. The game ended. It was a draw, one all. As the Republic player Alan McLaughlin said, the safest place to be was on the pitch. That night in November was the catalyst that ignited in my mother, a working class girl from loyalist East Belfast, the emotional fuel of shame. It was the catalyst that compelled her to hold up a mirror to herself and her tribe and tell the story of Kenneth Norman McAllister, a Protestant dole clerk who did everything he could to escape the smell of poverty to a middle-class world behind the Venetian blinds, a world where he could believe what he was meant to believe and cleanly and nicely discriminate against Catholics and close his door on all the working-class bigots like his father-in-law until one awful night in November, Kenneth Norman McAllister was forced to open the Venetians, look at society dead in the eyes and ask the question, is it possible to change? Mary Jones is Kenneth Norman McAllister. I looked under his eyes. I saw the years of my pathetic bigotry and I had to get up, I had to walk away. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, look, I'll get someone else to take over. <clears throat> I'm really sorry. I stood in the middle of my office, my head was spinning. I felt like I was fantasizing about what I could do if I wasn't such a stupid little man, stupid soulless little prick. Was it even possible to change? Audrey, don't curve, he had the last jammy dodger again today, do you know that? Don't curve, he turns into one, just give me whatever you have. No, no, don't give me tea, I want coffee. Black coffee. For Kenneth, the first commitment to change was a baby step, a cup of black coffee. From a moment was to put pen to paper, and the next baby step for Northern Ireland was when a man in darkened profile sat on Ulster television after those atrocities of 93 and said, Lay down your arms, represent your people. The only way out of this is dialogue. That man was David Irving. David Irving was the political voice of the loyalist paramilitary group, the UVF. His own catalyst for change came in the compounds of Longkes Prison, where, as a former member, he had been held. Under the advances of the prisoner-led regime, through education, reflection, and a love for his own community, much like Kenneth, David began to open the blinds. He also met the enemy face to face. The next compound over were the IRA, and the Republicans and Loyalists would heckle each other through the wire as they played football. And much like when those men climbed out of the trenches on Christmas Day during World War I to knock a ball about, a dialogue was starting through the wire. Now, David Irvine would never have gone so far as to say the peace process started with football. But he did say, it sure as hell started in jail. 
Here was a new breed of spokesmen emerging from the catalyzing cauldron of the prisons onto the political scene who were more eloquent in the poetry of peace than their political overlords were versed in the prose of war. That dark and profile heralded the winds of change that began to blow through our society as John Humes and Jerry Adams, nationalist leaders, set up peace talks with the governments and men like Irvine were trying to baby step their communities back from the bloody brink. And for my mum, the world went raged and out of the storm, her shadow self, Kenneth Norman McAllister, emerged in real time. Kenneth became flesh in the form of working class Protestant actor Dan Gordon, and in three months the first act was written. But how the hell would it end? Well, the Republic had qualified for the World Cup, remember? When baby steps weren't enough, a stride was taken. In the play, Kenneth drives up the Catholic Falls Road. David Irvine's political party signed the Downing Street Declaration for another step towards peace. And my mum landed in New York and I see a green, white and gold to watch the Republic of Ireland play Italy in the World Cup. It was a joyous celebration, a million miles away from the terraces of Windsor. They watched it in Eamon Doran's bar. The atmosphere was electric. The Republic won, one nil. And as they all piled out onto the street on the second avenue, they stopped the traffic. The police had been called. And a policeman walked up there and he said, well, whereabouts in Ireland are you from? Belfast, she said. He said, I've just been on the news. There's been a terrible shooting near Belfast. UVF gunmen walked into a bar in Loch and Island and shot dead six people who were watching the exact same game. She had her ending. I looked around at this wild and wonderful celebration all around me, just a parade of the, the very best there was in human nature, and I, I, I tried to connect it to the worst. Impossible. Kenneth's story was over. The story of night in November was only beginning. Less than a year after the night in question, the play opened in the nationalist White Rock area of Belfast. The auditorium was charged. Jerry Adams was in attendance. Nobody knew what to expect. Dan exploded on with creative energy as he wheeled between characters, and as the curtain fell, the audience rose. The reaction was ballistic. The most astonishing performance people had seen in years. Many people found it very insightful. Many other people found it very insightful. White Rock's one thing you'd take as a Protestant community would be suicide. They'd find out the next night, because it opened in Unionist Ballyearl Estate. Bodyguards had to be hired. That night, my mum stayed home. She said, I have two wee children at home. In this case, you can't shoot the messenger. <laughs> Poor Dan. She was brave. She wasn't that brave. Whenever the play opened, the word was out. TV camera crews showed up. Security men guarded the doors. Something was about to go down, and it did, like a storm. But this time, a sea of different emotions from the other side of the tracks. A unionist politician was questioned as he left, and he said, I don't agree with a lot of that. But there is a grain of truth in it. And I'll tell you what, I laughed my leg off. So was that the seal of approval? No. Unionist media had got wind of it. This is Republican propaganda. It was all lies. The cauldron of abuse at Windsor had been mythologized. It was a few bad apples and a sea of benevolent sportsmanship. And so in a society of competing narratives, who are the revisionists? Even the staunchest defenders of that night have to concede that Windsor in the 90s was a shadow of itself. The team colors of green and white have been replaced by the political stripes of red, white, and blue. But many in the fan base and the Protestant community hated the play without ever having seen it. And as controversy gathered, the threat of paramilitary backlash was still credible. My mum had a phone call to make. She sat down with David Irvine in the Longfellow Bar in East Belfast and she said to him, am I safe? This was a man who was the voice of one of the most feared groups in the country, who knew all about risk, who had numerous death threats over his own head as he tried to bring these people towards peace. He said, Mari, you have nothing to worry about because everybody thinks you're a man. <laughs> Nobody believe a woman could have written that. It wasn't enough. He said, look, will you come and see it? This was a man who was walking a very delicate line with his own life, the lives of others, and the future of the country at stake. He said, Mary, I can't be seen to go to something like that. After a few more minutes of pressure, finally David Irvine took a stride. He says, look, I'll go. I'll sit at the back. No one can know I'm there. On the one-year anniversary of the Lock and Island Massacre, 
surrounded by the friends and family of the victims. David Irvine sat in darkened profile at the back of a chapel in Cross Gar as the lights came up on night in November. That night, Kenneth's Damascene journey became a reality in the room, and as the atrocity of the, the crime that had claimed their loved ones' lives was laid bare, there was shocked silence filled with anger, shame, and sorrow, which then gave way to a catharsis with Kenneth's final declaration, I'm a free man! I'm a Protestant man! I'm an Irish man. Everyone exploded onto their feet in a mess of hope and tears, and the, the parish priest ran onto the stage, overcome with emotion. He had recognized an unexpected face in the auditorium. He said, David Irvine's here, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to bring him up onto the stage. <laughs> a silence swept the room. David Irvine reluctantly walked down the aisle. As he passed my mum's seat, he leant in. He said, Mary, I'm going to friggin' kill you. He was brought up onto the stage by the priest, and there he thanked them, and crying, he hugged them. And then the applause started, and it grew into a thunderous roar as the loved ones of the victims of that horrible atrocity gave a standing ovation to the man who was the voice of the men who committed it, a man who was now doing everything in his power to bring those people towards peace. A piece of theater allowed that moment to happen. Afterwards, David Irvine said to my mom, Mary, I can't believe you made me hug a bloody priest. <laughs> Change was happening. That night, Davy was the star. He and all the other theater goers came back to our house. There was a couple of American producers there. They wanted to take the play out to New York. They asked, would Davy come with? He turned to my mom and he says, Mary, no. You're an artist. You can take strides. I'm a politician. I can only take baby steps. But whenever you look over your shoulder, I'll be right behind you. David Irvine was true to his word. In the following months, he took a thousand baby steps and a couple of strides to deliver the Loyalist ceasefire in the Good Friday Agreement. The next morning, I came down, bleary-eyed, and I said, what were you all doing here last night? And my dad said to me, last night, son, history was being made here. Now, there's your lunchbox. <laughs> a night in November, and David Irvine were creating the changes necessary for me to go to school in a peaceful society. Football was downstream from politics. If the catalyst for Kenneth and Mary came with that night in November, for many others in the stands that night, it came with the treatment of Neil Lennon. Neil Lennon was our best player in the late 90s and a Catholic, but that wasn't his crime. His crime was he'd signed for Celtic Football Club, who were the mortal Fenian enemy of the loyal Billy Boys who had hijacked Windsor. Death threats were made on him. At the next game, his every touch was booed by the sectarian Boo Boys. Many of the genuine fans left Windsor ashamed and sickened, vowing never to return. But testament to Neil's incredible courage, he came back to play for his country. And they came back too. His first touch was met with the expected boos, but also unexpected cheers. The genuine fans of the Green and White Army were seizing upon the sea change in wider society, and they cheered his every touch, and suddenly the bigots were losing their voice. The fight was on. The Irish FA and the supporters clubs were taking their own baby steps. Sectarian songs were met with denigration. Singing sections were set up to drown out the bigotry. Team colors became expected. It was self-organized, self-policed. Many of the fans who stood apathetically in their number that night in Windsor were now taking the fight to the Billy Boys and winning. And attendance has increased. Men could bring their families. There was children, there was joy, there was a carnival atmosphere. The tide was changing and that sea of red, white, and blue became a puddle and was now being swept away by a dormant ocean of green and white. A couple of years later, a close relative managed to convince my mum to go to Windsor Park. She was skeptical and nervous. I mean, here she was, the, the Salmon Rusty of Northern Irish football, walking straight into the lion's den. As she took her seat, a couple of fans recognized her. And then the chance of shite in November rang out around Windsor Park. Her response was typically theatrical. She took a bow. <laughs> and believe it or not, the cop cheered. Here, where she brought the curtain up all those years ago, she was receiving her curtain call. Their pantomime villain was harmless. Every story needs a bad guy. In the final minutes of that game, Northern Ireland were losing 4-1, but to the chance of, we're gonna win 5-4, we knew we were already winning. 
I'm only 15 minutes, so this is the interval. There's so much more I want to tell you. I want to tell you how the Northern Irish fans went on to receive the accolade of the best fans in Europe and how the team qualified for their first major competition in 30 years. And there, in France, at the Euros in 2016, both sets of Irish fans were awarded the Grand Vermeil, the Medal of Honor of the City of Paris for their exemplary sportsmanship. Night November went on to become a seminal piece of peace process theater with success all around the world. 25 years later, I directed the anniversary production, this time now treated as a history piece and framed by the successes of Northern Irish football. Our tagline, is it possible to change? And Northern Ireland, baby steps. At least we're getting some new side of the building. <laughs> Let's continue to build on the legacy of men and women like David Irvine. Change needs a catalyzing moment from which you derive emotional fuel and a new vision, whether it be in a jail cell or a football match or even this talk. Change needs to have baby steps, a cup of coffee, an outstretched hand, sit down and make a list. The foundations will move, the ground will start to shake, but you keep your feet through the dark times of the feats, the massacres, and when you get your balance again, take a stride, whether it's a song or a football match or a ceasefire. Change has momentum, but it needs nurtured. There will always be the Lock and Islands to drag us back and make us ask the question, is it possible to change? So is it possible to change? Ask <laughs> Mary Jones. <laughs> ask Kenneth Norman McAllister. Ask David Irvine, ask the IFA, <laughs> ask the Green White Army, ask the people of Northern Ireland, is it possible to change? Ask yourselves, is it possible to change? Yes. Thank you. <laughs>